Thank you everyone for coming. I know that you know you guys, it's hard to take some time out of your schedule. Thankfully, as somebody who's now done their degree, that I don't have to worry about that. But I'll level with you and say that this weekend I experienced some of that pressure. I procrastinated probably a lot more than I should have when making this. So if there's a couple parts that feel like they're not completely well polished, that's why. So just bear with me. But this experience to be here, I think, is an example of what's so important about what George Brown is about, and just generally post-secondary education. Having a, a, you know, professors like Ingrid uh, really, really makes a difference. Uh, people who care about the work that they do and transferring that to you uh, is, is a huge thing. The reason that I get to be here today is because my sister Rachel was in this program and if you don't know or you weren't at the event in April, the Threads event, I believe it was, it's called, right? The Threads event, there was the Rachel Ennis Memorial Fund. My sister passed in April, and it was a big deal for uh, my family and I to be able to go and celebrate the success and the opportunity that she had while at George Brown and how much she enjoyed it. So to be here today uh, really means a lot. So thank you for being a part of that. <clears throat> so, Ingrid asked me to come and talk about finding and keeping a good job. And when a lot of people think of a recruiter giving a talk on things like this, things like show up to your interview on time, have you know, good spelling and punctuation in your resume, that sort of thing comes to mind. And I don't really want to talk about that because that's something you can find in a 10 piece article literally anywhere on the internet. But before we really get started, I want you to think about what a good job means to you. What, you know, where do you want to see yourself? And I think in fashion, it's a very important industry. It's very interesting. In fashion, your work has meaning. And I want you to think about the difference between a job and work, right? What is your life's work? No one talks about your life's job. The job is the series, in my opinion, is the series of tasks that you have to do to put something out into the world, which is going to be your work. So, you know, working or, you know, working in fashion, Think about the impact that your work is going to have on somebody. Clothes are an expression of who we are. The work that you do is going to have an impact on how people uh, think about themselves and try to identify with the people around them. Style is a way to say who you are without having to speak. Unfortunately, I'm not able to dress well enough to be able to just skip this presentation and send you a picture of my outfit, but you know, here we are. So what does a good job mean to some of you guys? I'm going to pick on you a lot. A good job would be something that um, is something that you're interested in and something right. that you're willing to put work into. So it's something that you're interested in and willing to put it work into? Something that pays well. Pays well? In the back? Um, me particularly, like hours that aren't so short, like, I wouldn't want to be 9 to 5 on day to Friday. Right, and that makes sense. So all of these things that you guys have said with flexibility, uh, paying well, enjoying what you do, is well reflected in this. I basically just sent out a bunch of texts, posted on LinkedIn in my Instagram story, and those themes are repeated. Now as students, I want you to think about also, think of jobs that are going to be learning, op uh, learning opportunities, right? It's going to contribute to your career. So as you start to think about what you're going to do, realize that you have the opportunity to be selective. It might not feel that way, and there's a lot of shit entry-level jobs out there that serve their purpose, but as long as you're building towards that goal, that's what matters. Um, and also, watch your communication. I actually had this really fun lesson. I texted one of my best friends, what is a good job to you? And he said, I don't know, effectively performing a task. So, you know, think about those things. Think about the image and the communication that your work is going to have, especially with fashion. So to help you understand who I am, uh, I'm 24 years old, so I'm probably just a few, you know, a couple years older than you guys. And uh, I live in Mississauga, I always have. So the commute this morning, getting here for uh, the morning really sucked. I'm not used to that. I also work in Mississauga. I went to UTM. And I got uh, my bachelor's degree in uh, science with a specialization in psychology. And I think I want to eventually get into industrial and organizational psychology, which is known as IO Psych. Here I have a spread of pictures all throughout my life. And although you know some of them are kind of rough, uh, 
I think it shows that people change. Their, their appearance changes and the way that they see the world changes and the work that they want to do changes. In my own life, I originally wanted to be an orthodontist, but then life, the calculus for life science happened and I quickly realized and didn't drop out like I should have, but I realized quick that that wasn't going to work for me. So now, then I went into you know, the uh, idea of being a psychologist and now I'm a recruiter. So things change, but as long as you have a plan and you know, a rough idea of what's going to make you happy, you need to keep thinking about that. So as a recruiter, what do you guys think a recruiter does? Anyone? Recruits. Recruits, yeah. A designer designs, yeah. yeah. So, but what do you think of when you think of like recruiting? Like what, what, is that, what does that involve? What are those people? So even though I've had really bad success, or zero success setting up my friends on dates, I like to think about it like that. I know what an employer is looking for, like what they would be looking for in a, in a date, and I know what a candidate is looking for, and it's my goal to kind of fit them together like puzzle pieces. So why does all of this information about me matter? And it's because it shapes the way that I see the world. When you, you know, understand somebody, it allows you to you know, take from them what, what they're trying to share with you. So I'm a young person, a couple steps in life, I think, ahead of you. Uh, I'm interested in studying the processes that we have to go through, how it affects us, and the effect that we have on others. And then I do this every day. And what I, I really want to try and do is help you understand you know, the, the toolbox of you know, small skills and outlooks, and, and, and consistently build on, you know, or add to your toolbox with different things so that we can all work to being the best version of ourselves. So to do this, I've kind of broken the bulk of the presentation into three sections. So your vision in you is going to be now. What can you work on as soon as you leave this room? Or even if you just want to tune me out and start on it now. Uh, finding a job is going to be, you know, once you're done school or maybe right before you finish school and you're starting to look for something. And then keeping a job once we're a couple more steps down the road. And then if there's any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, and then I'll wrap up. So your vision in you. What's really important here is, is you and then the vision. You need to be able to focus on what's going to make you happy. Your career is your career, not somebody else's. So understand and have a perspective of what it is that you, know, you see for yourself. What are you going to obtain and earn? What are you going to be doing? What's going to make you happy? Think about where you're gonna live, who, who you're going to be, who your friend group is going to be, what your sex life is going to look like. All of these things are going to contribute into what makes you happy while you're working through the journey of life. So to get started on this, you need to, to understand who you are. It's kind of like when, if you've ever played a video game where you have a character, normally you have to like allocate skills or you know, some kind of trait to the, the character to allow them to do things differently throughout the game. So evaluate what those are for you. And Dragons then, they give an evaluation at the beginning of every pitch. They say, this is the, you know, the work we're doing, you know, a little bit of an intro, then they say, this is what we think it's worth. And that can make or break the pitch right off the start. Sometimes they're on track, and that's great. But on the flip side, sometimes the Dragons will disagree. And least often, it ends up being an underdog story where the people making the pitch end up being a lot more valuable than they thought. And that's a really positive experience. But you know, what makes better TV is the other side, when they think they're super valuable, and then the dragons disagree. And if you put, it makes for good TV, but if you put yourself in their shoes, you can imagine that that would be a really painful experience. To have this thing that you've been working on, that you've indebted yourself $500,000 on, to have somebody tell you, you know what, we actually we don't think that's worth putting our money into. But it's a powerful lesson. And similar to Coco Chanel, I think my grandfather has a similar story. Um, he came to Canada from post-war Germany, essentially dirt poor. 
but he had trade skills. He was a metal worker and a machinist. And eventually, you know, he applied his craft once he got here and saw success with that. But as, as he continued his work, he realized that that wasn't going to give him the life satisfaction he wanted. So he decided to open his own company. Now, as somebody growing up in post-war Germany, he didn't have much of an education because he had to work to survive. And what that meant was that when he, it came time to run a business, he realized that there was a lot of things he didn't know. And in his retirement, he ended up being so successful that as a retirement project, he built this winery. Now, I asked him when is he... Is this in Brooklyn County? Yes, it is. Oh, Walking Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. I'm you know your wine. I'm a uh, man. Oh, really? Wait, sorry, sorry. I digress. I'm in shock. <laughs> yeah, Ed Noyes and Marina Caymans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was like the first guy in Brooklyn County. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, so he's a lot more successful than I was going to get into, but yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's... I feel like doing a small world. Wow, this is weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a small world. So on this property, there was actually, there was actually a tree that was planted the day I was born, but, you know, wow. we'll stay focused. So I asked him, I, I went to visit once, and he, we were talking about my report card and how he never really had an education. So I wanted to know, how are you so successful? And for him, the trick to being so successful was knowing what he didn't know. So he started a business. He didn't know anything about accounting or business or sales or marketing or human resources. So he uh, uh, you know, identified with that, found an accountant that he could trust, learned about business and sales, and you know, addressed the things that he didn't know. So I introduced this idea of capitalization and compensation. It's not about money. It's about knowing what your strengths are and knowing what your weaknesses are. You can allow your strengths to take you great places, but it, your weaknesses are always going to be trying to pull you back. So if you know what the weaknesses are, and you know what the strengths are, you can capitalize on those strengths and then compensate for the weaknesses. <clears throat> so one of the things that you can immediately start addressing if you realize you don't know much about it is networking. Now as a recruiter, you know, I get to know people personally and professionally. This is kind of what I live on. Unfortunately for me, most of my business is in the U.S., so I don't get to know a lot of people, you know, too personally. But it's a it's an important skill. When I was in Frosh Week, somebody had said, "Meet everybody that you can. You don't know who, what opportunity they're going to lead you to. They could just be a really great drinking buddy, or they could be somebody who, like some of my friends, are doing their PhD, starting businesses. You never really know what an opportunity is going to be." In the very first slide, there was a picture of me at the top uh, in front of the Radcliffe camera in Oxford. I did a study abroad there um, in, in, with U of T. And I have a friend in scouting who knows, basically, so was it his son's best friend's uh, best friend lives in England because his wife uh, is a, psycho uh, a psych psychology researcher. She used to work at Oxford University. And now she's doing something else, but the point is that connection was completely accidental, right? But that, that one person was an opportunity that I would have never seen coming. And so I got to sit with her, we had lattes, and we talked about psychology, education, different avenues I would be able to take it, and it's part of how I ended up kind of getting involved in recruiting, kind of building that framework for me. And networking is easy. A lot of people don't really know what it is. But it's as simple as a, hi, my name is Eric. What's your name? Deanna. Deanna, nice to meet you. And what are you studying? Fashion design. Fashion design. So what do you want to do with that eventually, or at least so far? I would love to go into costume design. Into costume design? Perfect. So if this public speaking game really works out, maybe you know, I'll end up being, uh, go you know, from a voice actor into some other kind of actor, and then I'm going to need a costume. So now I can talk to Deanna. My LinkedIn is on the first slide. It's on the last slide as well. So if we connect a couple years down the road, maybe we can Right? Every, every person is a new opportunity. Now the problem is that networking is mostly accidental. Me meeting uh, my scouting friend and just happening to talk about the program that I was involved in, I didn't wake up that day knowing that was going to happen, but it did. So knowing that networking is accidental is kind of vague and doesn't really help you with anything. So what you need to do is, is take control, take agency, and work with intentionality. Go on LinkedIn, just randomly talk to people that look interesting. They'll either not reply and R-bomb you, or they'll just, you know, 
maybe engage you if you ask them a question or say, hey, your work is really interesting, that sort of thing. You don't really know what kind of opportunity could come out of that. Go to school events like this or alumni events. Talk to your professors. Uh, go to parties. You never know. I mean, successful people like getting drunk, too. You, 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 know, you never know. There's opportunity everywhere. Now, one of the things that you need to keep in mind to be successful in your networking is to work on your sales skills. And I don't want you to think of a sleazy salesman. Sales skills aren't about taking money from other people. It's about communicating value. So if you're going to go to employ an employer, right, like, okay, you, uh, you two are sitting together, right? Imagine that you're in the same classes, studying all the same stuff, doing the same projects in the same group, and you go on all the same extracurricular activities. Then you leave school and you get a, you know, an entry level job that's the same. Essentially your value is the same. But if one of you is able to communicate your value better than the other, you're inherently more valuable than the person who can't because people know what your value is. Right? If you have a diamond above ground and a diamond buried underground, the diamond that you can see and you can hold and you know is there is more valuable than the one that you don't know about. So now we're trying to find a job. And to give you sort of the idea of things you can think about uh, in being creative and being bold and authentic when you're trying to find a job is a story of how I ended up in the, the workplace that I'm at. So I work at a firm called Top Quality Recruitment. And like I said, I went to UTM. I used to wait tables at a restaurant across the street from UTM. And when I was finishing school, I knew that I, you know, recruiting might be an option because I didn't want to really get into uh, psychology too much as a psychologist. But I wanted to be able to use it, and I wanted to do so in a business setting. So I started looking at recruiting, and LinkedIn popped up, and it said, hey, there's some jobs near you. And it turned out that one of the firms that it was suggesting was on my way home. So I had already been applying to some stuff. I had my resume on my phone. I was in my waiter's uniform with the, the logo on. I walked right in and said, hey, I'm looking for the person who posted this ad. And they didn't really expect that. All of the stuff, their application they they'd had up to that point was online. And so simply because I just walked in the door really formed an impression. And now we still joke about it because they, you know, they like, or when I told them that I was gonna do this and they were trying to kind of build my confidence a little bit, they teach public speaking as well. They said, you know, like we, you're the kind of person that comes up with creative solutions. And being creative and original is something that all of us have the capacity to do. We just have to put that effort in, step out of our comfort zone, and do it. So when you're searching for jobs, look at job boards. I mean, I use LinkedIn and it worked for me. You don't necessarily have to, but it's a resource that's there. Leverage your network. You know, just ask around. See if your, uh, your, you know, your professors know anything, your teachers know anything, uh, a family friend or a friend's parent. You never really know who has what connection. Again, every person is an opportunity. So like I said, step out of your comfort zone and be open-minded. You know, it was out of my comfort zone to come here today. I'm not used to public speaking. It was out of my comfort zone to just walk into a place and introduce myself and hope they would start paying me on a regular basis. But I did and it paid off. And it could have failed. I've had a lot of other you know, uh, instances where I've done things like that and it, it didn't work out. But I survived and, and made it through to today. And be open-minded. You know, somebody might, who knows you maybe perhaps a little bit better than you know yourself or is just throwing an idea out there, don't say no to something. If, you know, I hadn't been open-minded to the benefit of learning how to speak in public, I wouldn't be able to do this today and, you know, create that sort of name for myself and present my own value, right, and work on my own sales skills. So these pictures here just are about an idea of an approach you should take when looking for new opportunities. And I think about it as like trying to hit on people like at the club a little bit. You know, the whole side, you're not going to pick one person and stay on them all night. That won't go well. And you won't also hit on every person that's out there because other people will see it and, you know, it's going to waste a lot of time and energy. So what I suggest is pick a type, right? Everybody has a type and in work that's going to be your interests and your skills and your, uh, your hobbies. So take a clustered approach. I mean, maybe you can go for something a little out of the comfort zone, but at the end of the day, if it's not even in your area of interest, don't bother spending too much time on it. Now as you start this process, you're gonna to have to create your sales pamphlet, or as boring people call it, the resume. So resumes look very different. 
I, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with a resume. So, like, who has a resume right now? Okay, and are, are, you, are you happy with it? You're pretty happy with it. Why? What makes you happy about it? We talk about spelling and grammar, and yes, that's important, but it's not everything. I looked back at my resume that I had submitted when I walked in to, uh, my, uh, into top quality recruitment, and I, I looked back at it and realized it had a typo. And you know, a lot of people get stressed out about it, but you know, even if it's like when you submit a paper, yeah, you're going to get marks deducted off for having a, an error on your cover page or you know, something like that, but people make mistakes. Your resume is a representation of your work, and yes, they're going to treat it like that and say, if you can't represent yourself, you know, how are you gonna do work for us? But people make mistakes. If you have to write 20 reports in a week for your job or you know, whatever it is, you're gonna make mistakes in some of those, and probably one or two, you're gonna make major mistakes. So it's okay, understand that you know, things can go wrong sometimes, it's all about, you know, every day just putting the best foot that you have forward. So there's no perfect resume. Just be concise, don't write a novel. If you've got a lineup of people trying to get their resume submitted, as somebody who reads resumes, I can tell you that sitting there just reading resume after resume, especially if they're at over two pages, it, it's so dulling. And nowadays, with the world so stacked against us, with competition so high, everybody starts to kind of look the same. So you want your resume to have information that's easy to find. If you're gonna go into design and you're using a particular software and the job you're applying for wants that particular software, make sure that they know you have that software and have it somewhere very obvious. Because if they have to look for it, they're not gonna bother. Especially if you can figure out who you're actually applying to, the, the person that's reading the resume. Understand the employer's perspective. No, try to get in their head and figure out what are they going to find important? What do they want to see? If I was hiring for this position, would I hire me? And if you wouldn't, go out and fix it. That's part of your self-evaluation. References uh, are, are pretty simple. Uh, actually, employees for a second, I want to touch on, also know who the person is. If they're going to be in HR, their job is to take off boxes and then put you through to the next round. If it's the person that's actually the one you're gonna be working with, that's a good moment to really inject some personality. So, you know, different resumes and trying to communicate, like, this is who I am. You're gonna be spending eight hours of your day or more with the person that's hiring you, most likely, or at least with the team. You want them to know who you are as you go in. Now, references, keep this simple. First, tell them that you're using them as a reference. I see this go wrong every day, where you call somebody up and they just weren't expecting it. It's really awkward and doesn't look good. But when, once you do that, just put their name, why they're even relevant as a reference, and try to make re pick references that are going to be relevant to what you're doing. And then just give their, their phone number and email, and you know, tell them to expect a call. Now appearance. Uh, I had some fun with this, and I think this is something you can just keep in mind uh, as you, you know, do your work, especially in a more artistic field. I asked some of my friends to take the information that I presented with this slide and redesign the slide and come up with, you know, knowing what their craft is, the work that they're trying to do, and see what they would come up with. So this friend is an interior designer. And when I look at this, I'd see something really interesting. Sarah does not, but uh, I do. As an interior designer, she organized information by putting it into little rooms. And I found that so fascinating. Maybe I'm reading a little bit too much into it, but perhaps an employer would as well. And my third example is going to really highlight this effect because I did it on purpose. Um, this, um, so we had to redesign the slide format. My friend misunderstood what I was saying. It seems to be a, a common thing for me, but she, you know, she chose to use colors and a lot of um, kind of small images. She's a third grade teacher, right? When she presents information, she's used to doing it in a way that's super broken down and easy to follow. Now, I don't know if some of you recognize this bag or this pattern, but it's the pattern from Victoria's Secret. So I told my friend to, you know, it's a recognizable brand, so design a slide as though you're somebody who works 
at Victoria's Secret. And there's a few things she ended up doing. So she used a bag, right? If you're using or uh, designing a resume for a job you really want. Again, this, you know, it's about finding the balance of the targeted approach. But if you can design your resume to use the branding of the company that you're applying to, that just shows that you understand their image, their reputation, what they're trying to do. So she also kind of, you know, put her sense of humor into it, right? I'm quick and easy. If you're going to be, uh, and you know, I can, I can spell and I grammar good. If you're going to be applying for something like, you know, the Twitter account, right? Think of all those corporate Twitter accounts that have super uh, good roasts of, of other people. Burger King is in Wendy's or one that comes to mind. If you're going to be doing that for Victoria's Secret or a job kind of along those lines, inject some personality and show them that you're able to, you know, come up with some, you know, some ideas before you even get started. And at the bottom is a reference, uh, you know, or like how you should format a reference, who, the, who you are, who they are, you know, why they're relevant, phone number and email. So now you've made it to the interview, congratulations. Uh, how many people have been interviewed for a job? Okay, um, gentlemen in the back, which image do you think represented the interview that you had? Try to hate them as much as possible and not personalize with them because they're your enemy. But you know, they, there's so many different possibilities, right? Just having a casual conversation, having lunch, um, doing a panel interview. Uh, and I put the interview one because I love that movie, and two because sometimes it's just really you know the most personal or sort of the most casual type of conversation. Um, and, and so there's there's so many different ways to do it. So there's no perfect interview either. Right? Nobody's really been trained on how to conduct an interview on other people, unless maybe you're in the CIA. Like, no one's ever taught, they never say like, okay, when you, you know, do the interview, I want you to look for this thing and this thing. It's all about what the person wants for them. So again, get into their perspective, try to understand them as well as you can, and that will build a connection between you as you begin to understand them. Appearance is obviously important, but you probably don't need me to tell you that. Uh, but remember again, you're selling product number one. And that's you. Be proud of who you are. Be proud of what you know how to do. Work on those sales skills of being able to mitigate the appearance of your weaknesses because you're addressing those, you'll work on it and capitalize on your strengths. And questions, ask questions, right? How is this opportunity going to fit into your vision, right? Like going into the next section of keeping a job, right? You should know the job so well at the start before you even get in there that you're, it's not going to be a concern for you that you're going to want to leave. Obviously, shit entry-level jobs are a little bit different because the purpose there is for you to kind of earn your keep, earn those rewards, and earn the opportunity to develop and grow. But thinking about positions in general, as long as you know what that position is going to be before you get into it, you're going to be happy and your employer is going to be happy. And it's going to you know, hopefully work out as a win-win. So some skills and behaviors. Consistency is extremely important to me. I think that if, like if you're working out and you have a real, or you know, think of, think of it in work terms, you can draw the two together. If you work out every so often, maybe once every six months, you're not gonna get in shape, right? Even if it's a good workout. Just like a good sale, if it's ever, some businesses are different, yes, but for the most part, if you're a salesperson, having a good sale once every six months isn't gonna really get you anywhere. It's when you have constant, consistent performance, right? So as a student, right, constantly keep upkeeping on your work, and I talk about procrastination. Like I said, this weekend, I was literally this guy because uh, I, I pushed it off, right? Other things, I allowed other things to get in the way. I knew that I would be doing this back in April, then in September, we planned the day. And yes, I had ideas and I had a rough plan of the things I wanted to talk about and how I organized it, but I still had to you know, put it together. I had to practice. And I procrastinated. So again, reevaluate your, constantly evaluate yourself, 
step out of your comfort zone, always be learning. And that will allow you to be more consistent. And dedication, right? Dedication really shows, especially when you pair it with consistency. For example, my sister Rachel, when she was here, she was a very dedicated student. She had passion for fashion, and it was everything she'd done. Leading up to that point in her life, she, I think she started school around 28. So she finished high school um, and then started working right away. And she did a lot of retail work, and she got very good at it. It was what she loved to do. But she made the decision to take her life to the next level. So she came here, and she you know, participated in Uptown and Downtown. And we would you know, talk about it. It was really cool to see it, because we'd talk about it in the mornings while we were both kind of rushing to school um, and fighting over the shower. But, uh, you know, and so being a passionate student who's consistently on time, consistently doing good work, it, it leaves a mark on your, or it leaves, leaves a, a positive imprint on the network that you're trying to build of, of, of opportunities, right? People will hear about you, people will want to get to know you and hear what you have to say. Um, yeah. So happiness. Uh, if, you know, it's not clear, this is the one thing that I'm most concerned about, people taking away from their finding a good job, more importantly, finding good work, right? It's about enjoying, uh, happiness is two Ps, purpose and pleasure, right? So there's things in life that are simple, maybe they don't necessarily feel as productive. Uh, you know, time, or time you enjoy wasting is not wasted time. For me, I like spending time getting wasted. You know, it's, it's not a productive habit, but it's, I find it fun. My friends and I go out for uh, a couple beers relatively often, and you know, it, it's a good time. And getting to connect with my friends that way uh, works for us, and we take pleasure out of it. We have a lot of really good stories. Um, I take my dog for walks. Uh, you know, and, and, and so there's, there's so many things that you can do that aren't, or aren't necessarily on the beaten path. But as long as you're enjoying the time that you spend out of work, it's going to allow your work life to be a lot better, right? If you're unhappy out of work because you're worrying about personal finances or your romantic relationship, or you know, you don't really feel connected to your workplace, that happiness is going to manifest itself in the work that you do. It's going to allow consistency and dedication to be a lot easier. So it's an important thing to make sure that you're always addressing. Again, your work life is going to take up eight hours of your day. You should have eight hours of sleep, and so that leaves, I think, like eight hours left. Again, math is not my strong suit, but I think I'm right. So it leaves another eight hours, right? So enjoy, enjoy the work day, and then make sure that the rest of it is going well, too. Now, having a good perspective, um, like I said, entry-level jobs are often shit. I got lucky to have one right after school that I really enjoy and it's affording me a lot of opportunities. But you also have to know, in an industry that can be as brutal, especially like fa fashion, right, it's very competitive. And so if you, you know, go in with a sense of entitlement and thinking that you deserve to immediately be fast-tracked because you have an education, which I think is really prevalent today because the younger generation, just based on our society, is usually more educated than the older generation. We have more opportunity to go to school, there's more schools, there's more interesting programs, right? So you have to know that you're there, yes, that job might be hard, and yes, it might not be exactly what you want to do, but if it's serving its purpose, that's what you're there for. You're there for you know, a very specific reason. That's your place in life for that time. It doesn't mean that it won't change. But on the flip side, you have to know your work, right? What are you aspiring to? What's your vision? How, you know, is, is something holding you back? At the same time as, you know, allowing yourself to kind of roll with the hardship that you might have in your workplace, you also have to be able to, you know, balance that with advocating for yourself and getting the most out of it for yourself uh, that you possibly can. And this idea of what you are versus what you will be. I kind of stole this a little bit from, uh, actually a lot from Eric Thomas. And he says, be willing at any moment to sacrifice what you are now for what you will become. So if that means that for you to be successful in your work, right, the thing that makes you happy and brings you joy, and if you're going to be successful in that, 
and you need to, let's say the hours that you're working during the week aren't enough, so you have to start working on Saturdays. But you really enjoy going out with your friends on Fridays, on Friday nights. So what, what do you do? And the reality is that you're gonna have to make a sacrifice. You're gonna have to say, sorry guys, I can't right now, I'm really working on this you know, particular thing. This weekend, because I procrastinated, I had friends ask me if I wanted to go do something, and I had to say, no guys, I'm sorry, I have to sit at home and pretend like I'm back in school, which I actually really enjoy, I'm not gonna lie, but anyway. Um, so just be ready for that, right? And it's a hard process, there's no simple way to do it. And for me to just say, you know, hey, follow these steps and it's gonna be easy would be doing you a disservice. You have to, you know, be ready to buckle down and know that what you're working for isn't just to get a paycheck, it's to leave a positive imprint on the world and actualize your vision. So again, be a student, right? Have that student mentality. If you're at work and you're not learning, you should probably address that. Well, you should address that. But also know when you need to stick with it. Um, if you, like if you decide that you're gonna run a marathon, you're gonna have to run pretty much every day for six months to a year to even get close to being able to run a marathon. So, you know, just because you don't see results right away because an opportunity hasn't been offered to you right away, that doesn't mean that it won't happen eventually. So just kind of stick with it, understand your place, but also, you know, keep your, your vision and your worth in mind and just continue on. So does anybody have any questions? This can be anything, I, I think we're doing pretty good on time. I have two. Yes. Um, on the resume. Yes. What about the picture, yes or no? Again, personal decision, right? If you're gonna be an accountant, the culture of that position, generally speaking, is that you're somebody who performs a very regimented set of tasks, and who you are performing that doesn't matter as much. Yes, once you get into management, if, you know, firms, like uh, law firms or accounting firms, that your personality and who you are is going to matter more. But personality doesn't matter in the entry level. You know, something like what I do, my personality is who I am, right? It's, it's the biggest asset that I have. So connecting with people for something like with what I do is going to matter. In fashion, that might be even more important, right? Fashion brands are people's names. The person behind it is important. Yeah. 
I think that everyone here should have a LinkedIn profile if you're going to be working in today's marketplace, uh, job marketplace. So yes, your LinkedIn should absolutely be on your resume. Your other social media really depends on what you're doing with it. Some people have Twitter accounts that they consider to be part, an aspect of their work. Like, you know, doing photography, your Instagram is going to be incredibly important. So it's, it's up to you to wage, right? My Instagram account is private. There's a lot of images of me going out and drinking and doing things that aren't particularly a good idea necessarily, but, you know, from a professional perspective. So I didn't put it on my resume. I can tell you that right now on my desk, like the, the, de like the pile of resumes I have to read is really long. So if every resume is, is one page, I have about 20. So if every resume is one page, I still have to read 20 pages. If every resume is two pages, now I have to read 40 pages. So if it's over two, I'm highly against that because nobody wants to read that much. Uh, so again, it's just being concise, evaluating what information is actually important and then using your sales skills to figure out what they actually care about. Thank you. Well.